as you ingest your last bite or sip of calories, that's not when the fast begins. That the important thing here is to establish a feeding window that you can comfortably manage. It's out that people cheat, but they don't cheat in any kind of obvious way. They might, people typically maintain or lose weight on the one meal per day schedule. First, let's talk about food volume and food type and how that relates to whether or not you quickly or slowly enter a fasted state. Because clearly, when we talk about a feeding window, that feeding window could include any number of different foods. It could involve cake and ice cream, pizza, hamburgers, plants, fruit, whatever it is, or it could involve just fats or just proteins, etc. There are at least three factors that are going to govern how quickly you transition from ingesting food to a fasted state. Remember when the fast begins, that might be when the fasting begins on your watch or on one of these apps that I'll refer to later, which can help you track your fasting and eating windows. But that's not when it actually begins because your body is still seeing food. You're actually carrying around food inside of you. Even though you're not putting it into your mouth, you are still eating in some sense. So it should be somewhat obvious that very large meals are gonna take longer to digest than very small meals. So that will impact how slowly or quickly you migrate from a fed state to a fasted state. There's no way I can spell out what exact volume of food you should ingest based on the size of your stomach and et cetera. But you're all familiar with being extremely full, very full, comfortably full, somewhat full or not feeling full and feeling hungry. So learning to gauge food volume is important. Also foods that include some fats or a lot of fats will tend to slow gastric emptying time and Depending on the kind of fats, it could mean that a given meal is digested within three hours versus five hours. So more fats might be a large meal with a lot of fats is going to take five or six hours. A smaller meal with less fat is going to be digested more quickly. Uh, consuming calories in liquid form is going to mean that gastric emptying time is going to be faster. And then of course, there's the glucose and the insulin aspect to it, which is that foods that lead to big steep rises in glucose, like pure sugars, then your glucose will drop. However, if they're combined with fats, then it tends to be a more gradual rise in glucose and it's more sustained, et cetera. Fibrous foods will also create a more uh, long lasting sustained release in glucose. The important thing here is to establish a feeding window that you can comfortably manage, okay? Meaning that on average, you can obey a six hour feeding window or an eight hour feeding window or a 10 hour feeding window. And then to place that feeding window in a social and life context that you can manage on a regular basis. Now there are two key points that have been gleaned from the scientific data about this feeding window and when to place it. And this is based on a really important experiment that Sachin and his colleagues have been doing. There's a website that they have, a zero cost website called My Circadian Clock. You can go to this website um, free of cost. There are a number of important resources there, but what they've done is they've examined the feeding behavior of thousands of people. People will take a picture of the food they're about to eat and it enters into their account, maybe your account if you create one, on my circadian clock. And they do this over many days or weeks. What's great about this is it establishes what's essentially called a fetogram, a time in which people ate. And a number of important findings have emerged from these fetograms across large populations of people in different time zones with different schedules, et cetera. First of all, almost everybody underestimates their feeding window meaning people who think that they are on an eight hour feeding window or six hour feeding window, when their data are analyzed, it almost is always the case that they're actually on a feeding window that's one or even two hours longer than they think. You think, well, how could that possibly be? If people are taking their first bite at noon and they're taking their last bite at 8 p.m., well, that must mean that they are on that feeding window of eight hours. And it turns out that people cheat, but they don't cheat in any kind of obvious way. They might have, you know, a glass of wine after dinner, or they'll have a cup of tea and a little bite of a cookie. And so when people are honest and they are honest in most cases, uh, for this, uh, experiment, what you find is that most people's eating window is actually quite a bit longer. So in discussing this with Sachin and reviewing the literature, it's clear that if you'd like to be on a 10 hour feeding window, that you should probably select an eight hour feeding window because there's always a little bit of a taper on either side of that eating window. Very few people are extremely strict about these eating windows. It's just hard to do in the context of life events and social gatherings and, and family and so forth. Okay, so as we build forward your ideal fasting slash time-restricted feeding schedule, we now have 
several different rules that we can list out. First, at least no food for the first hour after waking up, at least one hour. Two, no food intake for two and ideally three hours prior to your bedtime. Three, if you want to select an eight hour feeding window, then you should probably focus on a six or seven hour feeding window because in reality, your feeding window is going to be longer. Reality meaning real life constraints. And if you'd like to be on a 10 hour feeding window, you should probably select an eight or a nine hour feeding window because the way it plays out is that people almost always eat outside of their eating window somewhat. The other nice thing about selecting a slightly shorter eating window than is comfortable for you is that it takes into account that as you take your last bite or your last sip of calories, there's this time or taper before which you are actually in a fasted state. And because you're eating different things on different days, presumably, some foods leave your gut more quickly, some things spike your insulin and your glucose more than others. Sometimes you eat more fat, sometimes less fat. This allows you to fall well within the margins of the benefits of time-restricted feeding that have been demonstrated in humans, which generally involve an eight-hour window or so. So I think this eight-hour window or six-hour window is a good thing to shoot for for most people. Some people, and we will discuss the exceptions, but some people truly are exceptions to this. They just require more food. And along those lines, I just now briefly want to touch on some of the studies that have looked at using a very short feeding window of about four hours. Nowadays, a number of people are doing the so-called one meal per day or are restricting their feeding window to just four hours or six hours. And that turns out to be an interesting strategy. And the data around it actually are a little bit surprising. One surprising thing to leap out of this massive literature review on time-restricted feeding in humans is that relatively short feeding windows of say four to six hours do produce a number of positive health effects, things like increased insulin sensitivity, which we know is good. Remember type two diabetes is a reduction in insulin sensitivity, improvements in beta cell function and the pancreas, decreased blood pressure, decreased oxidative stress, decreases in things like evening appetite. So positive health effects and psychological effects in general. However, they either produce no change in body weight or they tend to produce even increases in body weight. Now, of course, there's variation between individuals and between studies, but this is somewhat surprising. So the eight hour feeding window seems to be very beneficial across almost all the parameters that we've discussed, inflammation, weight loss, fat loss, et cetera. And adherence, I should mention, people's ability to stick to the diet seems quite good on this eight hour feeding windows. But when people try and undergo very short feeding windows of four to six hours, it seems that they are overeating in that four to six hours, at least overeating with respect to their metabolic needs. Now, the contrast to this is the so-called one meal per day schedule. Very few studies on one meal per day. One meal per day, unless it's a very, very long meal, a sort of feast, typically would not last four to six hours. I guess it sort of depends on how you define a meal. But when you look at the very few, I should emphasize again, very few studies on one meal per day, people typically maintain or lose weight on the one meal per day schedule. So what we can say is that the seven to nine hour feeding window produces all of the major health benefits of time-restricted feeding, as well as being pretty straightforward for most people to adhere to on a regular basis. And on a regular basis turns out to be very important. I'll get back to that point in a moment. Whereas the four to six hour eating window doesn't seem to serve people as well as say a seven or eight hour eating window, simply because people are overeating during that eating window. 